Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to our study of the Epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch. Today we're going to cover chapter 6 in his Epistle to the Magnesians. As we do this, uh, or rather before we do this, let's begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your mercies which are new unto us each day. We pray, dear Father, that you would grant unto us penitent hearts, that we may acknowledge our sins to you, that we may uh, flee from them, and that we may instead flee to your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that in him we may enjoy the forgiveness of all of our sins, the promise of eternal salvation, and the newness of life which you call us to walk in today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're looking at Magnesians chapter 6 today, and um, here in chapter 6, uh, he is then picking up his comments from chapters uh, 2, 3, and 4. So back in 2, 3, and 4, he had begun to speak about, uh, about the bishop, uh, about the Episcopal office, uh, just kind of in general terms. Uh, however, then, in chapter 6, he's going to expound upon this a bit more. And this is going to give us an opportunity uh, to talk about the office of the ministry, talk about uh, the grades within the office, and how all this fits together then. So let's look at chapter 6. That's on page 207 of the Ignatius PDF. He writes, Since therefore in the persons mentioned above, I have by faith seen and loved the whole congregation. I have this advice. Be eager to do everything in godly harmony. The bishop presiding in the place of God and the presbyters in the place of the council of the apostles and the deacons who are especially dear to me since they have been entrusted with the ministry of Jesus Christ who before all ages was with the Father and appeared at the end of time. Let all, therefore, accept the same attitude as God and respect one another. And let no one regard his neighbor in merely human terms, but in Jesus Christ love one another always. Let there be nothing among you that is capable of dividing you, but be united with the bishop and with those who lead as an example and lesson of incorruptibility. There's chapter 6. So, if we look at page 3 on our study guide. It's available in the link uh, in the video description below. Question number 26, what is the relationship between faith and love in verse 1? This is something that we've spoken of before back in uh, his epistle to the Ephesians. But here we see it again. Since therefore, in the persons mentioned above, those persons mentioned above, by the way, if we turn back to chapter 2 on page 203, he had said, um, yeah, inasmuch as I was found worthy to see you, the congregation, in the persons of Damas, your godly bishop, uh, the worthy presbyters, Bassus and Apollonius, and my fellow servant, the deacon Zoshin. So uh, the Magnesian congregation had sent their, their bishop, these two presbyters, and this deacon uh, to meet Ignatius uh, there in Smyrna so that uh, so he's, he, they're refreshing him, and, he, and he's rejoicing in their presence there. So uh, if we go back to chapter 6, those are, those are the persons mentioned above. He says, uh, Since therefore in the persons mentioned above, I have by faith seen and loved the whole congregation. So for Ignatius, as we've mentioned before, faith and love always go together. This is the way the scriptures have faith and love. This is the way the Lutheran confessions talk about faith and love. Where there's faith, there will be love. Uh, and love uh, does no harm to neighbor, Paul says in Romans chapter 13. Love uh, delights in God's commandments, which are his will. Uh, so we can say along with the psalmist in Psalm 1, uh, in Psalm 119, you know, I delight to run in the way of your commandments. I, they, they, they're my course, they're my path that I walk in. So because we have faith in Christ, because we have faith in the true God then, uh, and through that faith, salvation and newness of life, in that newness of life then, we love. So he then, by faith, has seen and loved the whole congregation. Now, he has specific counsel to them. He says, I have this counsel, I have this advice. And he says, be eager to do everything in godly harmony. The bishop residing in the place of God and the presbyters 
in the place of the council, the apostles and deacons who are especially dear to me, uh, since they have been entrusted with the ministry of Jesus Christ. So his counsel for them then is uh, to do everything in godly harmony. And so again, just like in the epistle to the Ephesians, we see this as a major theme coming through in his epistles, then, this idea of a godly harmony, uh, that uh, we are all on the same page, so to speak, uh, that we are all running the same race, that we all have the same faith, the same doctrine, and therefore the same love. So do everything in godly harmony. And that godly harmony specifically then is harmony with the clergy, uh, with the office of the ministry then. So uh, we, we look on the study guide here, number 27, and it says, consider Clement's words to the Corinthians. Uh, so this is from 1 Clement 34. First Clement written probably 96, 97, 98 AD. Um, from the congregation at Rome to the congregation at Corinth. He writes, Let our boasting and our confidence uh, be in him. Let us submit ourselves to his will. Let us consider the whole host of his angels, how they stand by and serve his will. For the scripture says, 10,000 times 10,000 stood by him, and thousands of thousands served him, and they cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. All creation is full of his glory. Let us also then, being gathered together in harmony, with intentness of heart, cry out to him earnestly with one mouth, so that we may come to share in his great and glorious promises. So here again, a contemporary of uh, Ignatius here, except in Rome, and you have this idea of let us submit ourselves to his will, to God's will, and he specifically uses uh, to cultivate this harmony, uh, the image that Clement uses to cultivate this harmony is uh, the, the angels, then, the, these ranks of angels uh, who stand by and serve his will. A uh, thousand times, ten thousand, etc. Uh, and they all are crying out in praise then. So Clement is saying, let us also then be gathered in the same kind of harmony. And we put the Greek word there, uh, homonoia, uh, because that's the same word that Ignatius is using here in chapter 6, verse 1, when he talks about a godly harmony. Uh, so this was obviously a theme then for Clement, speaking to the Christians at Corinth, you know, a church that seems like it was perpetually plagued with the problem of disunity and strife. Uh, so this godly harmony, but also then, uh, you know, so Clement is using, uh, you know, just as the angels are in harmony with God in heaven, serving him, doing his will, uh, so we then ought to, you know, have intentness of heart, cry out to him earnestly with one mouth, uh, so that we may share in his promises then. So th that's just by way of saying, look, uh, Ignatius is not the only show in town that's talking about this harmony. Uh, it, it's a major part of First Clement because of why Clement is writing to the Corinthian congregation. They don't have harmony at that point. They have an intense amount of strife, whereas Ignatius is writing uh, not because these congregations lack harmony, but because they do, they already have it, and he wants them to persevere in it. Because once you lose that godly harmony in faith and life, it becomes difficult to get it back. So if we go back to chapter 6, verse 1, then, be eager to do everything in godly harmony. And then he starts talking about the bishop, the presbyters, and the deacons, specifically how the bishop is in the place of God, um, the apostles, the council of the, pre, uh, the, the uh, council of the apostles, the presbyters, and the deacons, then who have the ministry of Christ. In. So, this godly harmony that he wants them to embrace and continue in them is godly harmony with each other, but also then with the bishop, the presbyters, and the deacons. Then, so harmony is found um, in harmony is is manifested then in. Uh, our dealings with the clergy, and the clergy's dealing with the people then. So, here we also see then the three grades of the ministry. Uh, we have the bishop, we have presbyters, and we have deacons here. And we see then, number 28, to whom are the three grades of the ministers analogous? Well, he says, uh, the bishop presiding in the place of God, the presbyters in the place of the council of the apostles and the deacons, uh, have been entrusted with the ministry of Christ. So we want to unpack this a bit to ask, 
What does it mean that the bishop is in the place of God? Now, this doesn't mean that the bishop is God. Uh, it doesn't mean that the bishop has usurped God's place. It doesn't mean, um, you know, that, that any sorts of things like that. Uh, because this is not a matter of, of, of power, but of service and of ministry here. And so when it talks about being in the place of God, uh, he, is, he is God's representative. So let's turn in our Bibles to Luke 10, 16. Luke 10, 16. Jesus says, he who hears you hears me, he who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So the apostles are very much in the place of Christ. Uh, they're, they're in the place of Christ, who is then, uh, he, Christ represents God, he's the God revealer, uh, First John 1, 8, or John 1, 18, excuse me, uh, and then, then Christ sends the apostles. And so this is how the bishop is the mind of God, or, or in the place of God, rather, uh, you know, we said that, the mind of God, but that takes us back to Ephesians, his epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 2, where it talks about how uh, Christ is the mind of God, and the bishops are in the mind of Christ then. So there's that, that hierarchical connection to God. Uh, so that's what it means that the bishop is in the place of God. Uh, he is speaking in the stead and by the command of God. Now, number 30, what does the term counsel imply about the presbyters. Now, interestingly enough, uh, the, the Greek word here is uh, son, uh, synedrin. Uh, I'm pronouncing that wrong here. Um, synedrio. Yeah, so from the word we get Sanhedrin, then. Uh, so council. And, and by this, then, we know that there's more than one presbyter there in these congregations. So you had, um, you, know, you were moving towards a system where you had one bishop, a monepiscopate, several presbyters, and several deacons then. And so what this means, then, if it's a council, then they're assisting the bishop in his office. Uh, they're offering him counsel. Um, they are receiving the bishop's teaching um, in their being in unity, then, with the bishop, then. And then the deacons, with what are the deacons entrusted? The next question, well, the deacons are entrusted with the ministry of Christ. Now, this brings us to of the main point that we want to make in this lesson, in, in this session here, as we look at chapter 6. Because we want to talk about how these grades in the office, uh, how they kind of fit together. So, uh, if we look at number 32 on the worksheet, what two things does this analogy show us about the grades of ministers? So, first of all, we want to establish that there is, uh, there's first, there's one office of the holy ministry. Christ instituted one office of the holy ministry, just as there's one church, one Lord Jesus Christ, one faith, one baptism, etc. However, within the New Testament, we already see a distinction within that, uh, distinctions being made within that office of the ministry, that one office. So that, as we've mentioned before, to the Philippians, Paul can write uh, to the bishops and deacons. Uh, he can talk to, um, in Acts chapter 20, he can gather the presbyters of Ephesus. And he can tell them, those presbyters, um, that, that the Holy Spirit has appointed them as overseers or episcopoi, bishops. Uh, we see in the pastoral epistles in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3 and in Titus how uh, there's a lot of interchangeability in uh, the qualifications and duties from a bishop and a deacon. And there he doesn't mention presbyters at all. Um, but as he talked about in Acts chapter 20, presbyters then are also, you know, bishoping. Uh, so there's one office of the ministry. And, uh, but like I said, in the New Testament, we see, uh, we, we see some distinctiveness, but at least between these titles. There's interchangeability in the New Testament uh, within these titles. But once you get post-New Testament, especially then Ignatius, then he's the first witness to this fact that, uh, you begin to see more distinctiveness to where uh, the bishop, the Episcopal office, is becoming its own thing. It's still part of the office of the ministry. It's not its own thing separate from it, uh, which we'll get into here in a moment. But uh, it has a certain role, certain duties, uh, and then the presbyters and then the deacons then. So this analogy 
you know, uh, the bishop is in the place of God. The um, presbyters are the council of, uh, you know, what, how does he say that? Uh, the council of the apostles, excuse me, and the deacons, the ministry of Christ. What this shows us, I think this shows us both the unity and the distinction. Uh, the unity of the office, there is one office of the ministry, but also shows us the distinctiveness of bishop, presbyter, and deacon. So uh, now the unity of the office, you know, there is one office of the ministry, and that's by divine right. So God has established one office of the ministry and he establishes that in the scripture. He does that with the apostles. John chapter 20, Matthew chapter 16. Um, you know, there were we said in Luke chapter 10, 16. Uh, all these places that Christ is establishing an office of the ministry, an office which is um, to preach, to teach, and then to administer the sacraments. Go therefore and baptize all nations, etc. Uh, you know, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 1, steward of the mysteries of God, uh, which include then the sacraments, uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper, and then uh, the absolution. So we see this unity, uh, that, there, that there is a one office of the ministry by divine right, but we also then see that there is a distinction. Uh, there are grades within the office already at this time, again, coming from the New Testament, uh, and those exist by human right for the sake of order. So God didn't say in the scriptures, the bishop is above the presbyter and the presbyter is above the deacon or anything like this. This is just the church, you know, post-apostles sorting things out for the sake of order. Now, we can flesh this out a bit more, and we do actually do this in the Lutheran Confessions. Let's look at number 33 on our study guide. It says, consider the following from the Treatise on the Power and Primacy of the Pope. That's one of our Lutheran confessional documents. And we want to look for what do Lutherans confess as to the distinction between bishops and presbyters scripturally and historically. So this is, um, you can tell from the end here, this is from the treatise. This is paragraph 61 and 62. And it says, By the confession of all, even of the adversaries, that is the papists, the Roman Catholics, it is clear that this power by divine right is common to all who preside over the churches, whether they are called pastors or elders, or bishops. And accordingly, Jerome openly teaches in the apostolic letters that all who preside over churches are both bishops and elders. Let's stop for just a minute here. I think we've made this comment before on an Ask the Pastor video, but it bears uh, repeating again. When we talk about elders, that means presbyter, which is pastor in our modern day uh, parlance then. So, uh, you know, pastors, elders, uh, elder is the translation of the Greek word presbyter, uh, presbyter presbyteros. Uh, so Jerome writes that all who preside over the churches are both bishops and elders, pastors, and cites from Titus 1, 5 and following. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest ordain elders in every city, and afterwards calls these persons bishops. Jerome adds that. He then adds, a bishop must be the husband of one wife. Likewise, Peter and John called themselves elders or priests, presbyters, in First John, or excuse me, First Peter five one, and in Second John one. And then he adds, but that afterwards one was chosen to be placed over the rest. This was done as a remedy for schism, lest each one, by attaching a congregation here or there to himself, might rend the Church of Christ. For at Alexandria, from Mark the Evangelist to the bishops. Heracles and Dionysus, the elders, always elected one from among themselves and placed him at a higher station, whom they called bishop, just as an army would make a commander for itself. The deacons, moreover, may elect from among themselves one whom they know to be active and name him archdeacon. For with the exception of ordination, what does the bishop, what does the bishop do that the elder does not? There's a lot in here. That's a big chunk of text, those two paragraphs, but... This demonstrates what we were talking about as far as uh, the oneness of the office, but also the distinction in grades by human right. That's like by human decision. So, uh, and, and its purpose then. So in the first section, he's talking about how from antiquity, even in the scripture itself, bishops and pastors are the same thing. It's not as if they're divinely instituted separate offices. They're both the same thing because there's one office of the ministry, and that's why he says... 
you know, those who preside over the churches are both bishops and elders. That's St. Jerome writing that. Uh, and he mentions how uh, Titus uh, is supposed to ordain presbyters or elders in every city, but later on then he calls them bishops as well. So they're in the book of Titus. You have, he's to ordain, he's to appoint and ordain presbyters, and then here are the qualifications for bishops. So those terms are used interchangeably because there's one office. Uh, bishop uh, comes from the Greek word episkopos, uh, which means overseer. So it's the, uh, the, the episcopal office is the office of oversight, oversight of doctrine, oversight of life. Uh, and then also 1 Peter 5, 1, uh, Peter calls himself a presbyter. And then so does John in 2 John 1. He calls himself the elder, or again, the presbyter. So those are all interchangeable. Now, then he says, but afterwards, meaning after the apostolic age, one was chosen to be placed over the rest, and this was done as a remedy for schism, uh, lest each one by attaching a congregation to himself might rend the church of Christ. And then he uses the example of Alexandria, uh, the Alexandrian church, how uh, the presbyters all got together, and chose one from amongst themselves to be a higher station, to be the bishop, that is to be the overseer of their group uh, as a remedy for schism. Then. So the, the bishop is not, uh, you know, he, he doesn't have a special grace or anything like this. Uh, he doesn't have a separate, you know, uh, anything like this. It's a matter of God has called him through the presbyter, through, through, these, through these elders, through the presbyters, through these pastors, to serve as you know, their leader in this, to be the first among equals, if you will. Then. And then deacons as well can do the same. Now, in the very last, uh, well, I guess before we get to that, we should note that that's purely by human right. We don't see that in the Scripture, uh, the, the, those distinctions being made, because in the Scripture they're interchangeable. Uh, but this is a way then that the church has said, okay, there's one office and we're going to have three grades in it for the sake of good order. So just as every you know, um, army needs a commander, you got to have your CO, so you know the bishop will be our CO then. Uh, now, the very last um, sentence there, for with the exception of ordination, what is the bishop that the elder is not? Meaning, again, by human right, uh, the bishop is the one that ordains. That is not something that God uh, in the scripture specifically attaches or gives to the episcopal office. Uh, but rather he gives it to the office of the ministry. The office of the ministry can ordain men who have been tested, uh, called, you know, examined, uh, etc. So, uh, but again, in, for the sake of good order, you have it from antiquity that only the bishop is going to ordain. And this too is a remedy for schism. That way you don't have pastors in their individual parishes, in their individual areas, you know, ordaining just whoever they want. Uh, but you have a regularized process. Uh, that way you don't have pastors saying, okay, well, I want these guys over here to be a pastor, um, whereas they shouldn't necessarily, they don't meet the qualifications, or they shouldn't be a pastor, or, you know, they're false teachers, or whatever. So all of this is simply a remedy for schism. Now, we don't have this in the worksheet, but uh, Johann Gerhard, my favorite Lutheran theologian, speaks about this um, in his Loci on the ministry. On the page, uh, or rather... Paragraph 231, and if you'll allow me, well, I mean, you have to. I mean, you could fast forward if you want to, but uh, he says the same thing here, and he explains this. Uh, this is paragraph 231 under the title Bishops. To the grades of ministers in the church listed up to this point are added bishops, presbyters, and deacons. The word bishops, episcopoi, is taken from episcopane, which means to oversee, according to the interpretation of Augustine, uh, from City of God. Therefore, a bishop, uh, to the Latins, is the same as an inspector, or as we would say in the church today, a superintendent. Ambrose translates it as superinspector, Jerome as superintendents. In the holy writings of the New Testament, the word bishop is assigned in general to all who perform the teaching office of the church. For since they have been placed as bishops by the Holy Spirit to feed the church of God, Acts 20:28, 20, and since they are commanded to feed the flock, that is in their charge, exercising oversight, 1 Peter 5, 2. Therefore, they are rightly and deservedly called bishops because of this overseeing of the flock entrusted to them. So there again, you have the idea of this interchangeability of titles. All pastors are bishops. However, he goes on, to nurture good order and concord in the church, there formerly was established the sort of distinction among those pastors 
that some were entrusted not only with oversight over the flock entrusted to them, but also over other pastors and presbyters. As a result, it happened that the title bishop was attributed to, in a specific sense, to those pastors who had oversight over other teachers. Traces of that meaning are extant in the Greek translations of Numbers 31.14, 2 Kings 11.18, Nehemiah 11.22, as we have shown earlier. We shall investigate later whether the apostles themselves established such an order among pastors and whether traces of this meaning are found in their writings. He then goes on to talk specifically about bishops uh, and deacons, whether bishops are above presbyters by divine right. He answers no, uh, and then proves that from scriptures like Acts 20, 17, Philippians 1, 1, um, and other passages. Then. So, but Gerhard does a great job of fleshing out in his Loci on the Ministry. This is volume 2 that I'm reading from right now. Uh, does a fantastic job of, of um, taking what is said in the treatise here and expanding it uh, and looking at what the scriptures have to say then about the office of the ministry and the distinction between the grades, bishop, presbyter, and deacon, and how these are all, these are man-made grades. Um, and then also how that has precedent in the scripture then. So to go back to Ignatius, this is really then, uh, you know, Ignatius is at the beginning of this process. Uh, I don't know if we've mentioned it before or not, but in the Didache, which is another um, uh, second century document, probably from the latter half of the second century, uh, and probably written to you know, uh, podunk Syrian towns, uh, Christians out in the wilderness, you know, outside of Antioch, basically. They still had itinerant preachers at that time. And, um, however, they were having more and more problems with false itinerant preachers then, false teachers. Uh, and so whoever wrote the Didache, the Didachist, uh, urged them at the end of that to establish a regularized indigenous ministry among them with bishops and deacons then. Uh, Ignatius then, coming from Antioch, um, obviously has it there, and is, and they have it in Western Asia Minor here, Ephesus, Magnesia, Trollus, etc. Uh, and he's encouraging that that be maintained then. Again, for the sake of order. And so when, when Jerome says things like, this was established, you know, to, to ward off schism. And when Gerhard says the very same thing, we see this actually happening then in Ignatius. Because what's his advice that we originally that originally started this off on this trajectory? Well, be eager to do everything in godly harmony. You know, harmony is the opposite of strife, dissension, uh, discord, and uh, so harmony then is found in 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 the laity, hearing listening to and being obedient to the clergy, as the author of Hebrews says in chapter 13, it's also then, harmony is also uh, vitally important to have amongst the clergy. And this is why you have, like we said, uh, you know, just as an army would make a commander for itself, so pastors do the same thing and call a bishop for themselves then. And that's the entire point of this then. Uh, so in this small line here, uh, bishops presiding, presiding in the place of God, presbyters in the place of the council of the apostles and deacons who are especially dear to me since they have been entrusted with the ministry of Jesus Christ. Because of just in that one run-on sentence, you have the office of the ministry. There's one office of the ministry by divine right, uh, by divine institution. But within that, the church has freedom to establish different grades, again, for the sake of keeping order uh, within the church at large and within the clergy then. That's our discursus on, uh, excursus on um, the office of the ministry. Then it's a great opportunity for us to talk about it, uh, since this is such a major theme in Ignatius, and especially then since he's the first one to really flesh this out, uh, this threefold ministry. All right, even in First Clement, uh, presbyters and deacons uh, there in Rome. There's still a lot of fluidity between them, a lot of interchangeability. But that's a different different Bible study, as we say in these here parts. So let's move on. And number 34, then. Actually, before we get that, let's finish reading uh, chapter 6. Here. Uh, let's see. They are especially dear to me, the deacons, since they have been entrusted with the ministry of Jesus Christ, who before the ages was with the Father and appeared at the end of time. Let's stop there with verse 1. So... What does it mean, then, that Jesus was before all ages? And what does it mean that he appeared at the end 
of time. So here you have it, Ignatius, as we've seen in other places, and as we will continue to see in the future, you have in Ignatius certain sayings uh, that, that, that look forward to the Trinitarian debates in the 4th century, uh, before Nicaea and especially after the Council of Nicaea. And so here he is, uh, who was before all ages, or before all ages was with the Father. What this is, this is simply a confession of the eternity of God the Son, then, that, uh, that he's eternal, that he is from eternity. Someone just asked the other day, uh, I think it was in the ATV comment section, someone was talking about uh, the, the, the Son you know, before the Incarnation, then. And uh, the, the, the Father has always been Father. Because if, if God wasn't Father at a certain point, and then, and then at a certain point in eternity, if you could speak like that about eternity even, uh, you know, then that would imply change because he would then go from not being Father to now he's Father. No, God has always been Father because the Son is always there. So you get origins, um, you know, eternal generation of the Son. Uh, you know, all of that is latent in this, this phrase here that Jesus, uh, you know, who was before all, who before all ages before the ages, was with the Father. So that's what it means. It simply means that he is eternal, that uh, there has never been a time when Jesus wasn't, uh, or, or rather when, when the Son of God wasn't. He wasn't named Jesus until the Incarnation, I suppose. Um, and then also then, that he appeared at the end of time, that also shows us then just how Ignatius thought of things. Uh, you know, Ignatius is not alone in this. The early church fathers all of them really thought that they were living uh, in the last age of the earth. And really, we are. Uh, that's true because ever since Christ's foot left that stone on the Mount of Olives, ever since he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, uh, from that moment on, we have been in the end times. It's not a matter of, uh, you, know, you know, oh, something has happened in recent history and now we're in the end times. Uh, you hear that sort of stuff all the time still to this day. Ridiculous. You think... <laughs> You'd think people would get a hint and stop date setting and saying stupid stuff like that. Of course we're in the end times. We've been in the end times since Jesus ascended into heaven, for crying out loud. So, but, so he, when he says this, that he appeared, uh, or appeared at the end of time, it doesn't necessarily mean that Ignatius thinks, okay, Christ is going to return at any moment. Now, he, he very well could have, uh, as if it's like the end times like that. But rather, now that the Son of God has come, now that the gospel has been made known, now that it is being made known to all nations of the world, now we are in the end times. Uh, this is the final age of the earth, uh, because now that, this, now, that, now that the Savior, now the Son of God has been revealed to us then, uh, and because of everything that Christ prophesied about the end, uh, this is why then Ignatius can say these sorts of things then. So we have a confession of his eternity, uh, that he is eternal, and yet also that the one who is eternal, that has always been with God the Father, has now appeared to us in this last age of the earth, here in these end times then, to bring us light, uh, to enlighten us, to bring us salvation, etc. All right, well, let's look at verse 2 then, chapter 6. He writes, Let all therefore accept the same attitude as God, and respect one another, and let no one regard his neighbor in merely human terms, but in Jesus Christ love one another always. Let there be nothing among you that is capable of dividing you, but be united with the bishop and with those who lead as an example and lesson of incorruptibility. Okay, so... What does he mean here? He says, let all therefore accept the same attitude as God and respect one another. All right, that sounds simple enough. Uh, you know, Paul in Philippians chapter 2 says we are to have the same attitude of Christ Jesus among us. Uh, and that means that we are to humbly serve one another, that we are to be humble, humble ourselves before God and one another. Uh, but here he says, we are to respect one another. Not just tolerate one another, but to genuinely respect one another. 
and let no one regard his neighbor in merely human terms. Now this, this, this is good. What does this mean when he says uh, in merely human terms? Well, by merely human terms, he means uh, that we don't see people as man sees people. We don't see each other, we don't view each other as we do according to the sinful human flesh. Uh, but rather we see people as God sees people. Uh, we see them in Christ. Uh, in fact, here he says, uh, or, or I guess, uh, how does he say that? Uh, but in Jesus Christ, love one another always. So when he says, don't, uh, when he says, let no one regard his neighbor in merely human terms, but in Christ. Uh, merely human terms means that we see people sinfully. Um, we see them as objects to be used or to enjoy. Uh, we see them as, as people to use, uh, as people to abuse, uh, people to ignore, people you know, people who can give us something or people from whom we can get something else. Then. That's how people view other people when they're in the sinful flesh. Uh, people objectify other people. Uh, you know, they cast the lustful gaze upon people. They, uh, they, they, they look at people as easy marks, easy targets uh, to fulfill their own desires, to get rich, uh, you know, to take advantage of. How, you know, all these sorts of things. That's looking at people in merely human terms. It's looking at other people and saying, okay, what can I get from them? Or how can, how can I get them to help me further my goals and my sinful, my sinful desires? That's not the way that we're supposed to be looking at people, he says here. Rather, we're to be respecting one another. Uh, we're, we're to view people as God views them. And so, uh, apart from any sort of objectification, and we're not just talking about the objectification of lust here, uh, but, but any sort of objectification of people, where we're dehumanizing people and looking at them only as, uh, you, know, you know, again, people to, to, help us, to help us to get what we want at any given moment. Uh, as opposed to that, we're to view them in Christ, which is to view them as creatures of God that, that he has made, uh, people for whom Christ has died, uh, people whom God loves in Christ Jesus, and therefore we ought to love as well. We view people as people. That's something that in our world we, we don't have enough of these days. Uh, you know, people view people as, as objects, as things uh, as uh, you know, giving units Ugh, in the church sometimes you know perish the thought um, you know that's that's ridiculous or uh, you know as target demographics you know target audiences all this uh, you know we're not to view people like that we're not to view people uh, we're, we're to view them as individual people for whom Christ has died uh, so in fact let's look at a few Bible passages here let's go to John thirteen thirty four in our in the scriptures. John 13, 34, Jesus says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So again, how do we look at people? We look at people through the lens of love. We care for them. We want the best for them. We won't, don't just want um, the best for us, but we want the best for them as well. Uh, let's also go to 1 Thessalonians uh, 4. Nine. Oops, went too far here. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse nine. Paul says, "But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another." Okay, that's pretty clear. Let's also go then to Romans twelve. We've been to Romans 12 a lot in this study, especially in our uh, as we were looking at Ephesians. But Romans 12, uh, this time we want to look at verses 9 and 10. Romans 12, 9 and 10. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. And if we keep going, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, uh, rejoicing in hope, etc. Then, uh, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. 
Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all. If it is possible, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. And then finally, do not avenge yourselves. Verse 21, he sums it all up. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So again, this is the life that uh, the Christian is to lead then. As Ignatius says back in 6, verse 2, Let no one regard his neighbor in merely human terms, but in Jesus Christ, love one another. And he adds that word on the end, always. You know, there is no off-season in loving your neighbor. And the thing about loving your neighbor is it's a debt which is never fully paid. This is what Paul says then in the next chapter in Romans 13. Love is a debt um, that you can't say, okay, I've loved my neighbor enough for the day. It's a matter of, I'm always to be loving my neighbor. I'm perpetually to be loving my neighbor. Um, you know, and, and love, you know, love is the fulfillment of the law. So love is doing the law because the law is all about love your neighbor as yourself, at least the second table. But love also, uh, this is something that we don't talk about a whole lot, but love also is a, what's the word? Um, it's almost a preservative, you know, a defense uh, against the temptations of the devil. Because the temptations of the devil, they all are to go against the law. They're all to go against love. Uh, because whenever we sin, uh, because we are vocational people, because we're always in relationship with other people, whenever we sin, we're sinning against someone else generally. And uh, so in love, we're striving against sin. And instead, uh, we're striving against sin by, by, by living for the sake of others. What does this person need right now? How can I, what does my wife need? What does my husband need? What do my children need? What does my parish need? What does this person in the congregation need? How can I help this person? You know, where, where can I help and how can I help? That's what love is always seeking to do then. And it's a thing of it's always seeking that. Uh, so, you know, there's no off-season for love. Love is not a spectator sport. You know, let's come up with some more cliches if we want to. Uh, but yeah, let no one regard his neighbor in merely human terms as an object, uh, something that we can get something out of. But in Jesus Christ, love one another always. He goes on. Let there be nothing among you that is capable of dividing you, but be united with the bishop and with those who lead as an example and lesson of incorruptibility. So he's tying this all together then. He's going to keep going in chapter 7 that we'll get to next time. But he's tying this all together. Let there be nothing among you that is capable of dividing you. Well, what sort of things are capable of dividing a church? What sorts of things are capable of dividing uh, a congregation into factions? I, I know several of you who watch, and I just heard you snort. Uh, and some of you laugh at that. So, you know, kind of a chortle at that. Because you know, it's almost a matter of what can't actually introduce divisions into a congregation. Uh, the biggest ones, though, we see, though, are strife and division over doctrine. Most of us have been there, you know, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, etc. Um, congregational factions over doctrine kill the congregation. You effectively have, you know, more than one congregation within the walls of a single congregation. That doesn't do any good. Uh, when there's different doctrine in the congregation, uh, then it becomes more difficult to love uh, because love comes out of faith in the true doctrine then. So you know, we've all seen division over doctrine. We all know what the New Testament says about that. Uh, there should be unity in the church. There should be godly harmony uh, with the bishop, as, he's been, as Ignatius has been saying, with the presbyters. Uh, and that's around you know, their teaching, the heavenly doctrine then. Uh, so no factions in the congregation over doctrine. There's also then factions just over the fact that we don't love our neighbor as we should a lot of times. I mean, there's a reason that people often say, you know, make, make comments about, um, you know, personality conflicts within the church and whatnot. Um, it, it's just like in families. You know, it seems like sometimes the people that are the most difficult to love are the people in your family. And it's the same thing for your spiritual household as well. Uh, you know, Paul tells us to bear each other's burdens in Galatians 6, verse 2. And, you know, sometimes people act really burdensomely. That's not, that's not when they sin against us. That's a different animal altogether. Uh, but they're burdensome behavior. Um, and so with both of these, divisions over doctrine uh, and divisions over personalities, 
Both of these have to be avoided like the plague. And, and the first one, the visions over doctrine then are, um, they are mitigated. The defense against doctrinal division within a congregation is, uh, you know, unity with the bishop, unity with the clergy, unity with the pastor, hearing what they've said, uh, what they teach, and uh, staying close to that teaching, because that's, uh, again, he who hears you, hears me. As Jesus told the apostles and spoke to the office of the ministry then in Luke 10, verse uh, 16. And as far as personality, you know, divisions happening on that, those are just stupid. I mean, when that happens, uh, you know, at that point then, everybody needs to take a step back and say, whoa, hey, this ain't Christian. Uh, you know, we need to fix this immediately. When there's personality conflicts in the church or divisions over personality, um, then, then there's really a problem of Christian love going on. And if there's a problem of Christian love, there's generally a problem of Christian doctrine as well, since faith, you know, since doctrine is, is, is lived. Um, but yeah, so that's what's capable of dividing the congregation into factions, strife, division over doctrine. And unity, especially unity with the bishop, unity with the pastor, unity with the office of the ministry, unity with the teaching of the gospel. That is then the um, chief way of you know, keeping a congregation undivided and harmonious. Uh, in fact, one thing uh, I, I noticed years ago uh, when Holy Cross you know, left our, our former church body, uh, you know, it was very much a divided congregation. We had at least three congregations in one, at least. Uh, and uh, in the long, arduous process of, uh, of leaving our former church body then, uh, a lot of those factions dissipated. Uh, some because people realized that they, they could not uh, remain in good conscience, according to their conscience anyway, um, but because uh, their conscience was you know, bound to uh, you know, wicked ideas um, and wicked associations. But uh, we saw those divisions, e even, even personality divisions, eventually dissolving uh, because we had the same doctrine and we were all on the same page uh, and we all rejoiced in that doctrine. And that caused... Uh, that also then caused many people uh, to bear the burdensome behaviors, or the behaviors that they found burdensome in other people, to bear that with a Christian, with a spirit of Christian um, love and, and charity, uh, and still does to this very day. Then, so generally, if those personality conflicts in the parish, then that's because there's uh, there, there's something going on doctrinally as well. Maybe not officially in the parish, but amongst individual people, uh, because that sort of stuff happens. But thankfully, we have the Holy Spirit so that uh, he can mitigate those things, so that he can remove those from us. He can bring us to repent uh, and forgiveness. Now, if we turn the page to number 37, final question for this chapter. Uh, 37, how does godly unity serve as, an, excuse me, serve as an example of incorruptibility? He says there, but being united with the bishop and with those who lead as an example and lesson of incorruptibility. Well, first, incorruptibility is not a human attribute. Um, incorruptibility, uh, the, the, the inability uh, to undergo corruption, change, decay, that's, that's not a human trait. That's a trait of the divine. You know, the triune God is the only one who's truly incorruptible. Um, and so what he's saying here is then, uh, in your unity with the bishop, in your unity with those who lead, with the one whom Christ has placed in the office of the ministry there, that then is an example of incorruptibility. Uh, it's just as life with, just as God himself is incorruptible. Um, so then we become an example of that through our unity with the bishop and with those who lead them. With that, he ties together, you know, everything, these themes that he's been talking about in chapter six here. Um, you know, you have the threefold office of the ministry. You have these, these three man-made grades within the one divinely instituted office of the ministry. And the reason that that ministry exists uh, is for the preaching of the gospel, the administration of the sacraments, and the reason that the church, um, in her freedom, made these human grades then was to ward off schism as we as Melanchthon wrote uh, as John Gerhard wrote that we heard from him and so since strife and dissension is in Ignatius's point of view uh, 
one of the, if not the worst thing that can befall a group of Christians, then how do you mitigate that? How do you defend? What's the bulwark and fortress against strife and dissension entering the congregation? Unity with the bishop and with those who lead. That's an example of incorruptibility, of the divine life that that's chapter 6 of Ignatius' Epistle to the Magnesians. We'll pick up next time with chapter 7. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give unto us a spirit of harmony with our brothers and sisters in Christ, that you would bring your church together in true unity of doctrine, that you would protect your parishes from division and strife and discord, We pray that you would keep us always in the apostolic doctrine, which the apostles taught and which then Ignatius after them taught as well. We pray that whatever it is that you have given our hands to do today, that we may do it in love for others and to your glory. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen.